the host and as a comedian as a host you would think that he would have material prepared even so he's about to start he said he was doing a, a tour a national tour and it's going to be a movie and all these things like pull some of that out there i know he might not want to use all his material right then but pull something. do something something man he looked awful up there say some old jokes you know what I'm saying? something say some old jokes from uh, from uh you know a routine you did two years ago something bro you know, as a comedian, comedians are um, they're at least you're, you're thought of a comedian as someone who, you know, off the cuffs can come up with whatever to, to you know, provide humor to a situation. You he, know what I'm saying? He, he and, rusted, and, huh? and, uh, and And for, you know, someone of his stature, someone who's been doing it for years, you know, you I, to me, I, I would expect more uh, of someone like that. Because even his open monologue, opening monologue, even the opening monologue was about five minutes of who's here, who's here, who, who's in the audience, who's in the audience, you know? Like, if, if nothing else, you would think the opening monologue would have had, you know, a clear, concise, you know, set of jokes, set of comments, something, you know? Because he, he didn't do the, a lot of, uh, mo- in, um, in recent years, you know, a lot of the hosts at the BT Awards, they'll come out and they, they do some kind of dance scene or sketch or something to that nature. Um, but, uh, this guy, he uh, he just came out and he, <laughs> and he, he, you know, he just, you know, like I said, he came out and was just calling out names, bro. I, I don't know, I don't know. I expected a lot more from Chris Tucker, uh, someone that is a vet in the game. You expect a lot more from these types of people, in my opinion. <laughs> Maybe he was telling the truth when he was like, you know, I'm doing this because I the IRS got me, and they pay. I need to pay this money back. That's why I'm doing it. Maybe he was telling the truth. I guess. His heart wasn't in it. I guess. It didn't seem that way. It didn't seem like he really prepared for this show. Right. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Didn't definitely did not seem prepared. Yes. All right. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Just moving on. One more comment here. And um, not about the BET Awards, but what do you guys uh, think about uh, the NBA free agency? Of course, Dwight Howard is on the oh, tour right now. Dwight. He's on the tour. They say he's met with with all the potential teams that he's got. He's thinking about. He's met with Dallas. He's met with Houston. He's met with uh, the Golden State Warriors. Uh, he's met with Atlanta, and he's already met with the Lakers. They say he's met with the Lakers twice now. What do you think? Wh- wh- where should he be? Should it be? Should it be going to the to the Houston, or should he go back to the Lakers? What are you thinking? Dwight don't know what he wants. <laughs> like he, he don't know. Uh, he wants to win a ring, but it's obvious he doesn't want to play up under Kobe, or uh, their dynamic isn't working, or something for him to even be thinking about looking at another team. He wants to be the big man, but part of being the big man is you can do it with a guy like Kobe. You can step back, or you can be the man. And he could have did that in Orlando, if that's the case. Like have a seat, Dwight. <laughs> have a seat. No, he could not do that in Orlando, by the way. He could have. Y- you need help. And he if he was Orlando, he would have needed Jesus. Well. <laughs> <laughs> the record reflects. Well, we got this draft. <laughs> this, uh, what, Vincent Victor. Is it Victor? Victor Oladipo. Yeah, yeah Victor they're, they're calling Oladipo. him the next D Wade and stuff. So uh, well, we'll, we'll, see. we'll see what happens. Potentially. We'll see what happens. We'll see what we'll happens. See. That was, uh, by the way, was that the only draft pick the Magic got? You know, they had uh, they got a guy out of Oklahoma in the second round. Oh, okay. forward, like six, seven around two thirty or two forty, something like that. Oh, uh, okay. All right. I was I was looking for that. I couldn't find whether or not we got a second draft pick. But uh we'll see what happens, uh, with Mr. Dwight. Um I, I think it'll I think he's gonna land in Houston though. I think Houston will be a better place for him because I don't think he can handle the Kobe pressure. <laughs> he can't clearly. <laughs> I don't think he can handle the Kobe pressure. I can't. But I mean, we'll see. There's no benefit there. Everybody on the tail end of their career. You know, everybody, you know, my, my thing was everybody had like, oh, it's the Lakers. Hey, Magic ain't played for the Lakers since the early 90s. And to me, ain't nobody else there worth going to play with. <laughs> you know, everybody trying to live off history and tradition. Right, nobody cares. The history and tradition is in Miami currently. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. You know, these guys, they, they don't care about, oh, it's the Lakers. Unless Magic Johnson step on the court, nobody don't care, you know. We'll see, man. As good as Kobe was, nobody look at him like Magic. Still, no, nah. you know, no, nah, they don't. And they got the same amount of rings. Yeah, they do. 
Probably gonna end their careers with this thing, right? And there. you know, it it also goes with personality, though. Like Magic was a charmer; he had a personality. He to had go with a personality. It. That's the thing. And he was a leader, right? Kobe, he's, not he's a always come off as a butthole. He's like a, I'm, he's it's not a, a gospel station, so I say it correctly. I mean, he's just been a jerk. Great player, but jerk. Yeah, and he's not a leader. He doesn't. doesn't he doesn't well. make people better. Yeah. I agree. So we'll see what happens, man. Hopefully uh, by the end of the week we'll get something out of Dwight. Maybe. Maybe. Can't sign to the 10th, so until the 10th, nothing is official anyway. But uh, we'll, we'll, we will move on. We have uh, Miss Alicia Payton on the phone. How you doing tonight, Alicia? I'm doing great. How you guys doing today? Oh, hey, we're Alicia. doing pretty good. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Alicia, Alicia's calling uh, again to give us some legal opinions about uh, what's been happening in the George Zimmerman trial. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off with some questions for you, Alicia. Okay. Uh, my first question is, um, so, of course, the, the main charge or the, the biggest charge on the list is the, the second-degree murder. So from okay. a prosecution standpoint, what is it that they need to prove in order for that to, to be the charge the jury goes with? Well, in order for the prosecution to sustain a charge of second-degree murder, they're going to have to prove that Zimmerman shot and killed Trayvon Martin with a depraved heart. And uh, just a basic way to explain a depraved heart, he, they have to show that Zimmerman acted without regard for human life when he took Trayvon Martin's life at that time. Okay. All right. So, so they have to prove that he could care less about Trayvon, per se. Um, and he sort of, you know, he was the target of the moment. But there would have been a target regardless, almost. Is that kind of, am I well, paraphrasing? Not necessarily Trayvon, but just life in general. Right. At that time, that he just had no regard for life. So he did what he needed to do based on that. Okay. All right. All right. So, so, it so. It sounds very matter of fact, but that's really just what it is. That they just have to prove that it was a matter of fact process in his mind. Mm. And then, then in general, just not not necessarily on this case, is that is that typically something that's you know usually hard to uh, pin down for for the prosecution? Well, I can't quantify it by calling it hard or not so hard. I can say that it's it is um, very fact intensive. Um, oftentimes in the law, we we have to decide whether or not what we're going to argue is going to be fact specific, or are we going to be arguing the law. We oftentimes hear that attorneys argue one word. We can stand in court and talk about one word in the statute all day long and what the meaning of that word is. When we're talking about depraved mind, we're not talking about the words depraved mind. We're taking the facts and we're going to apply them to the definition of depraved mind and see if the facts fit. So whether or not it's hard or easy really depends on the facts at hand. Gotcha. Okay. All right. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, now, next question is the uh, the kind of the obvious one. What what do you think about what's been happening so far in the trial? Um, is it uh, swaying any particular way? Do you think? Well, since the last time we talked, we've seen a number of witnesses take the stand. I mean, from the residents of the townhouse complex all the way to Rachel Gentile. We've seen the medical examiner. We've seen a number of people take the stand and give their account of what's happening. And it's, we need to remember that we're still talking about the state's case in chief. I think that right now, uh, I think the defense is doing a great job of poking holes in the state's case using their own witnesses. So they're getting out a lot of testimony about how Zimmerman may have felt without actually having to put Zimmerman on the stand yet. And that's important to remember. So from a defense standpoint, I think they're doing a good job of holding their own. I think the state, however, um, is starting to prove in the last you know couple of days here that they haven't, they're not out of this fight yet. They've put a lot of research into um, Zimmerman's past interview, into what he's done maybe in his educational life, and also the common sense of what Zimmerman is trying to say happened. And they're using people with great credentials to try to disprove and dissuade the jury so that they can pull toward the state's direction. For instance, with um, the medical examiner talking about how the bruises and the injuries sustained by Zimmerman could have been taken care of with a Band-Aid. 
as opposed to sutures, which further helps the state's claim that you weren't in threat of your life being ended by whatever was going on in this scuffle. That's important because if he wasn't in fear that his life was going to end, then he can't substantiate why he used a firearm to defend himself. But but just, uh, I mean, I, I know you're a defense attorney, so <laughs> just thinking yes, from this I from a, a defense perspective, I mean, in the heart of the moment, one is not uh, obviously not judging, you know, the extent to my in- injuries. I'm just thinking, man, my, um, my head is hitting this ground and <laughs> my nose is bleeding. So, I mean, even with the medical examiner saying that, I mean, isn't doesn't that not really speak to the to the heart of the matter? That's just, you know, sort of an opinion outside after the fact that in theory, one is not thinking of uh, in the heat of the moment. Um, Yes and no. Uh, Yes, in that we don't know exactly how Zimmerman was feeling. Sure enough, if my head is being bashed on the ground, I I see that there's blood coming out of my nose, I'm not wondering, well, are these really life-threatening? Let me think about that before I decide to use my firearm. True, but what the jury is going to have to do is to take the feelings that the defense is going to say Zimmerman felt and determine whether or not those feelings are reasonable to Zimmerman in the situation. Does that make sense? Yes. So even though he may have been feeling like, well, I, you know, I feel like I'm on this ground, it's man on top of me, I just have to do what I have to do. The question is, was he reasonable in his reaction based on what was going on? So even if it's shown or the jury believes that Martin is on top and that he's profusely punching a dozen times, as Zimmerman said in his interview with Hannity, that he was punched a dozen times in the nose, even if that is the case, the question is, is the response to being punched a dozen times in the nose a gunshot to the chest? Is that the reasonable response? Gotcha. Hmm. Gotcha. Wow. You got any questions, Ms. Gray? No, I'm I'm just watching. I have so many comments to say about this trial, but it's so much more that can be told or that's going to be told, so I'll just... Just watch. <laughs> now, one of the things I found interesting uh, too, Alicia, is listening to the um, to the lead detective. Um, I can't think of uh, what is it, Sperano? I think it is. Yes, Valerie Rao. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the, th- the comments that uh, I think Marco Mera got him to admit, which I found very interesting, and I wonder how this plays into everything is how in his initial investigation he he suggested that he felt satisfied where the where the case was um but then he was you know he felt the pressure to press further um and and trying to determine i guess something else if you will um i mean how, how does that play into you know the mindset of the jurors the in the case i mean the idea that there might have been some outside pressure that was sort of forcing this lead detective to to look further into something that he had pretty much already determined he knew what the situation was okay let me let me backtrack for a minute i, I misspoke i said valerie route and the lead detective is actually sereno sereno um, let okay. me apologize for that but your question i don't i don't quite understand well i, I remember the on friday there was a lot of the um a lot of questioning of the lead detective, and, and I remember, I don't remember the exact question, uh, but but there were some questions that Mark Romero asked where he, where he was inquiring whether or not the lead detective felt some outside pressure in into looking, I, I don't know, the way he described it as looking further, so that mm-hmm. he, the guy, he, he did his initial investigation, and he determined one thing, and then due to outside pressure, you know, he went back to the investigation and then he was seeking to, you know, maybe pull out something that he missed the first time or find something that he didn't find previously. You know, how does that play into the mindset of the of the jury potentially? I mean, that the idea that, you know, outside pressure is basically pushing this forward to do something that perhaps shouldn't have made it needed or done. Well, I, I don't really think that the idea that this detective decided to take a second look after whatever pressure may have been placed upon him is going to have a negative impact on the state. I think that Mr. O'Meara brought that question out to try to point to the fact that this detective went back a second time to look for something that he clearly never saw the first time. 
and that he wanted to get a result that would be pleasing to the media and to society as opposed to getting a result that was fair and accurate. However, the, the reality of the matter is, is that based on his second look, more information comes out that's not just information that he finds, but that's corroborated by other witnesses that the state has put on the stand. So I think at this point, it doesn't create the negative blow that uh, O'Meara and his team are expecting. So I think that the jury is going to take that um, more closely with a grain of salt as opposed to having um, a greater impact than, than anything else would. All right. One more question about his testimony. Uh, another thing Mark O'Meara got him to admit um, was the idea that for all intents and purposes, he, he felt like George Zimmerman was credible um, in his story. How does that play? Now, I know I heard, uh, I was listening today, I heard in, in one of their um, motions, apparently the judge asked for that to be stricken from the record. Mm-hmm. But but it was said, so, and the jury heard it. So, so, so what, what, you know, the idea that, you know, he basically finds him credible in his story. How, 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 what, how do you think that one plays? I, I, I have to believe that what the judge says to strike it from the record that it is stricken, but I'm also human. So once something is said, you can't take it out of your brain once you've heard it. You can't unhear something that's there. I think that um, if the jury does their job, they will disregard that information because the judge did make the correct ruling in taking that out but i think from a from a defense perspective it speaks volumes about how the cop perceived um mr zimmerman's statement however the question very carefully was just that did you find him to be credible only because his story never changed not necessarily that he was telling the truth which is why I believe the judge found that that information should have been inadmissible and needed to be stricken from the record. But if we listen very closely to how the testimony is is laid out, they're not saying that he's actually not lying about the series of events, but I believe that what the officer was trying to say, that based on the fact that I met with him initially on the night of the offense, and then I met with him three days later and his story did not change, I have no choice but to find him credible at this point. Gotcha. Okay, all right. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds good. I I appreciate it. So uh, we'll, we'll see how this thing goes then. Um, but uh, I don't know. So far, just just from my outside opinion, looking in, um, it, it at least seems like uh, one. I find it very interesting that a lot of the prosecution witnesses are kind of turning out to be great defense witnesses. <laughs> it, 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 that's what it sounds like and just listening to some of the testimony is the message that I would think the prosecution wants to get out isn't necessarily being displayed by their witnesses. I find that to be interesting. Um, I, I think I, I tend to agree that they are turning a lot of the state witnesses into some pretty good defense witnesses, but I don't think it's over yet. I, I think that at this point, both sides are required to deal with the witnesses as they come, good or bad, intelligent or not, um, societal backgrounds. That's what they have to work with. I, I think that it's very easy for us to think that the defense is, is kind of winning for all intents and purposes at this point because we hear them laugh, and their questions by nature are going to be very attacking, very hole-poking. But what I think we will find is that once the state rests and this case moves on to the defense's case in chief, we're going to see that the state is going to come back with a vengeance like we haven't seen before. Mm. All right. Okay. Guess we'll see. Do you think George Zimmerman goes up on the uh, stand based on what you've seen so far? No. Not yet. I mean, I think that the fact that they were able to play the, the recording sets up enough for self-defense, in my opinion. I don't see why the defense would subject him to uh, what could seemingly be a very crucial cross-examination by the state. I don't know why they would set him up for that. If everyone thought the genteel cross-examination was bad, I'd hate to see how Zimmerman gets cross-examined if he takes that stand. Gotcha. All right, man. We appreciate you, uh, Alicia, for giving those comments. You're most welcome. All right, thank you, and thank we'll, you. we'll uh, we look forward to hearing from you next week and seeing uh, where we are next week I'll with be this. Here. All right, now you have a good evening. Now you too. Bye bye. Bye bye.
All right, so that was Miss Alicia Payton offering some hey, legal I, opinions on uh, the George Zimmerman trial. Question. Uh, when she she put it out there, she's like, when she said, the, um, do you think getting punched in the face, punched in the nose repeatedly with somebody on top of you, do you think a, shooting that person is a reasonable response? I would just like your opinion. What do, what do you guys think? Is that a reasonable response? Yeah. If you're lying, on, if, if, I mean... If you're on the ground, somebody's on top of you, and they're repeatedly punching you in the nose, and you have a gun on you, do you believe shooting them is a reasonable response? Uh, I, I, honestly, I think it just it, it all depends on your state of mind as that person's punching you on the top of your face. Okay, I'll take yes. I, I, uh, <laughs> Miss McCray, yes. <laughs> what would you? Say? <laughs> I mean, I think if you have it, I think you know, if you have the gun on you, I think it does, you know, at least present possibly. I'm gonna try to fight back. And if my fighting back doesn't help, then, you know, I'm going to have to use I, my gun. I just, I just wanted to know because, I mean, like I said, if that indeed is the, or was the case, I ain't say I would have did it, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, like I said, I think um, there's, there's there's a logical representation of this case, and then there's the emotional, right? And exactly. um, and and the emotions are running high, um, especially when it comes to people's opinions. But um, but I, I think logically, you know, logically the I, I don't know. Just listening to what the witnesses are saying and the cross examination coming back. I don't know. I, I'd, I'd at least say there's, you know, the question here is not whether or not he's guilty or innocent. The question is, is there reasonable doubt? And, Correct. And, and that question, I think, has been clearly answered, um, and we're only a week and a half in. But like she said, it's not over. It is not over. It's not over. But, but again, the question is reasonable doubt. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think that question has been answered. It's but we'll see. Over. We'll see what happens, man. We'll see what happens. I've been even listening to some other uh, legal opinions, and um, and and I've seen a lot of them at least agree with the fact that they don't think second degree murder was the right charge here, and second degree murder has already been kind of killed. Um, and and this is goes from you know people who are defense attorneys, people who are former prosecutors, all of them at least agree with that, um, and at best think um, some kind of manslaughter charge would be the best thing that they might be able to get out of this deal. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens, man. We'll see what happens. Emotions are running high. Emotions are running high. Yes, they are. <laughs> but we'll move on. Uh, we have uh, our next guest is in the building to, um, and joining us. And so we're going to talk with her. Miss Jasmine Bernie's in the house. How you doing, Jasmine? I'm well. How are you all doing? Oh, we're doing good. We're doing good. This is our moment with jazz. Where's my, where's my music? Out? Hey! Oh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> wait, wait, you got your voice. You got to do it. You got to do it. A moment with jazz. Yes. <laughs> Snaps. 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 Thank you. There it is. We got her music together now. Go ahead, Miss Jasmine. What you got for us You tonight? all offer such a warm welcome. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> this week, I am talking to you about the Supreme Court decisions that have been made in the past week. Um, it has been extremely intense around here, and um, there have been a lot of decisions that some people would say set this, this, this the, the country forward 100 years, and then some say that we have been set back another 100 because of those decisions and that we're dealing with a bipolar Supreme Court justice, justices of the United States. So I want to go ahead and go into some of the most major cases that were decided on last week. And the first one is the support, the Supreme Court Affirmative Action case. Have you all heard about this one? This is where the young lady, um, her name is Abigail Fisher, a white woman who went to UT Austin, um, brought a case forward saying that she was unconstitutionally discriminated against her after she was discriminated against from the university after the state's flagship university rejected her application in 2008 under its race conscious admissions program. UT Austin now has to or last week had to prove to the Supreme Court that um, it was unconstitutional under the standard of the Supreme Court. And um, what initially, it, she was just admitted to the school. The school has a strict 
affirmative action policy. They look at every single student that comes into the institution. And she was one of those students who felt like she was discriminated against. And it's rare that we hear about students who are discriminated against who are Caucasian and not African American yeah. or of another um, racial background. So it's rare to hear that this young lady brought up this particular case, but it was one that was valid and felt that she was not allowed into the institution because she was a Caucasian female. And in some institutions have quotas to meet under the affirmative action laws and this so happened to be one of those situations where she unfortunately just was not accepted into the institution and so what actually happened this is an interesting one so the supreme court stated pretty much that the local level courts didn't take a look at this case seriously enough and just kicked it up to the supreme court so they've actually kicked it back down to the local level and said you all need to evaluate this and deal with this on a statewide level and not pretty much wasted the Supreme Court's time with this particular case. Nothing in this case is un unconstant nothing in this case is um, relevant enough that it needs to come to the Supreme Court and that it's necessary. Let me see. Justice Anthony Kennedy, writing for the majority, endorsed the Supreme Court's prior decisions establishing affirmative action as a cons as constitutional to further states' compelling interests in fostering a diverse student body which means that this justice feels like affirmative action is necessary in making sure that we have an equal student body of students that are diverse all the way across the board. What do you guys think? Are you all products of affirmative action, whether in school, workplace, anywhere? I, I don't know that in my life I could say that I've been a product of affirmative action. Okay. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know either. either. I would yeah. like to know. Okay. I would like to know, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think, I would, if I had to make a, a definitive decision, I would say no. Okay. Um, you know, I went to, I went to um, a historically black college, so mm. there was no, <laughs> there was no issue when it came to school. And not in the workplace either? And, and in the workplace, no, um, no, right place, right time, wow. basically. I'm okay. sure. So. Right. You can't, token. I don't think you could be sure. Sure token. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> my response to that because of these laws i don't think we can honestly say yay or nay well i we can think so i can honestly say that i know i've been i, I have advantaged from um be, from affirmative action mm -hmm. i know in a lot of cases and a lot of my employment opportunities i've been selected because of my race and no they haven't flat out said it but when you walk in a room and you're the only african-american they fill their quota right. and you know exactly. this without yeah. them saying it and i'm okay with that I mean, there, there has to be someone to represent us in the room. Um, and as long as you know where you came from, I see nothing wrong with it. You know, my, my our father used to say, you know, you do good at school. That's what you need to do. You need to find your good friend, have them get you that job. And they got they one. And they happy. <laughs> so just be that one. <laughs> be that one. All right. <laughs> so the next decision that was made on last week was the um, – Voting Rights Act. Voting Rights Act. Um, a portion of the Voting Rights Act pretty much was um, established in 19. The actual Voting Rights Act was established in 1965, and um, the Supreme Court justices, it was created in order to make sure that communities of color weren't disenfranchised during the election process, and that state-level government had to um, ask for permission from the federal level to make any sort of voter um, changes to make sure that they weren't being discriminatory. Well, this dis this decision was overturned on last week by our Supreme Court justices, and they have decided, and I'll quote, it says, our country has changed for the better. Mm. And this was Chief Justice <laughs> John Roberts. Man. That, yeah, that it's, it's changed for the better. While any racial discrimination is in voting is too much, Congress must ensure that legislation it passes to remedy the problem speaks to the current conditions. So what these justices are pretty much saying is that currently we don't have a racial situation in our communities. Although we've just had a past election that was a clear indication of all the racial discriminatory <laughs> issues that we could have ever clear. faced. Clear. Clear. <laughs> clear. He is, make, he is making a statement that there are no, absolutely no problems. States are perfectly fine. When the state of Florida had its own case that was sent up to the Supreme Court justices about three counties in our state who were affected by this particular portion of the Voting Rights Act that does not allow the state to make any decisions um, as it relates to communities of color or if it affects communities of color. Um, they have to go to the Supreme Court before making any decision on how those people vote in those communities. What do you guys think? Well, well go ahead. <laughs> 
I think this was the most important ruling that they did. It, it awful, mm-hmm. awful, because the next day, Texas, then Texas, and I believe um, I can't think of the other state immediately put into the laws that they were mm-hmm. trying to do before the election that pretty much would have knocked out most minorities. That's black and brown people. Correct. Who don't have IDs. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, look, look it hold up. Hold on. Get off that Fox bandwagon, J. Real. <laughs> I'm telling you. And these justices said it clearly that they're not, this isn't about, you know, we don't have racial issues. This is what these justices said. So well, they know the issue is race. L- yes. Let's be honest. And and uh, if you want to comment on the end, it's 407-894-1680 is the number. 407-894-1680 is the number. Now, now I read this. And, and what I gathered, basically what I saw that they said was that that particular portion, what I believe was the uh, the fourth, mm-hmm. uh, what, do, what do you call it, the fourth? Uh, the fourth amendment. Section, the fourth, 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 fourth section. section. So the, the fourth section. So basically they said the fourth section was null and void um, based on today's current environment. But, because, you know, there's a but in there. Mm-hmm. But they did say that if Congress wants to go back and basically renew it and come up with, you know, new stats and information uh, based on different distrim- discrimination that may be occurring and then create a new, a new map, right? Because the map that was being used for the last, you know, 30-something, 40-something years was based on a map of 1972. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we can all agree that where we were in 72 is not quite where we are in 2013. That I think we could agree on. That we can so, agree on. So what they basically said is Congress needs to come up with a new map based on where we are today. Now, I, I know what you're going to say. Congress can't do anything. Congress can't even decide on a budget, let alone decide on a map. Well, <laughs> well. You know, where we are today. Yeah. But but I don't I don't think the Supreme Supreme Court is wrong in their decision because all they're saying is Let's not look back where we were 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. Let's look at where we are today, and then let's create some, some laws and some you know, things that need to be in place, if they need to be in place, based on where we are today. That's what they said. So just a few months ago, where were we as it relates to voting? And I was just here talking about you were discriminatory here. practices and, among and we disagreed then <laughs> among communities of color. We yes. disagreed then but that, that all go. of these laws were being created specifically to to knock out black and brown folks. We you did. know, I, we disagreed then. You know, now I agree. These some of these laws are created to discourage um, or disenfranchise maybe the the uneducated voter that just votes. You know, without actually, you know, doesn't read anything. You know, they just showed up because people told them it was time to vote. Mm-hmm. You know, now, yes, those people, I think, are going to, could be hurt by by certain voter laws because they're not even going to educate themselves enough to know that the law changed and maybe they need to do an extra step in order to be able to go vote. Mm-hmm. But but ordinary citizens, ordinary citizens that are on top of their game and are paying attention to what's happening in the government and what's happening in their state, whether they're black, brown, or whatever, if you're on top of this stuff, the law isn't going to hurt you because you're going to be aware of it, and then you're going to prepare yourself in order to do and go vote. But no, it's going to The only hurt. person hurt is the person that ain't following the rules. Or their grandmother who who doesn't have the birth certificate from 1913 to go in and get her voter, her voter ID in order for her to go in and actually vote. That's who it's going to hurt. So yes. it's going to hurt those educated people, their extended families, their, the people who are in direct contact with them on a daily basis. But let me talk about the MAP situation, though. So we went through this great period of the census, and we have created all these redistricting lines here in the state of Florida and everywhere else that has gone through redistricting. The mapping is already done. Congress can look at the numbers to see how these maps were created. And by the way, there are lawsuits pending on those maps right now because of their discriminatory practices. But they can look at that to see how much the population has changed. Just here in Central Florida alone, our Hispanic population has tripled in comparison to the past 10 years. Clear indicators that times are changing, but our laws are not. So you want to keep laws, you want to look at where we are now, but not acknowledge the fact that where we are now is an indicator of where we were back then and that we're still talking about the same thing. If we weren't talking about the same thing, that means that something had to have changed. Nothing has changed. This law may need to be represented in a different way, but it's still the same thing. Everybody is being discriminated against in some form or fashion and making it difficult for people to vote. 
why do you want people to make it hard to elect you or re-elect you? Well, Thank I, you. I, that's one of the best quotes I did here on the radio. Like, they are making it harder for you to vote instead of to make it easier for you to mm-hmm. vote. For it's, it, everybody. It, yeah, it's a right. It's not like a privilege. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Correct. For everybody to be able to vote without issue, without obstacles, and then just to, as we like to do this conspiracy theory on this show, it's another way that the Republicans, your people, <laughs> are trying to make sure that somehow they start winning these elections all over again. If mm-hmm. they can get these people, these black and brown people who are, especially the brown people who are about to outnumber the majority of the Republican base, they're, it's, they're scared. They're mm-hmm. scared. They're scared. They see what is the future, what is possible. But that's all, that's a, that's assuming that all of these black and brown people are going to um, vote Democrat, you know. I mean, look at what has happened so far. And enough of them have made enough noise to scare some individuals into making these sorts of decisions. But let's move on. We have um, two more. Supreme Court decision um, made a decision on the DOMA Act, and that's the Defense Against Marriage Act. This act essentially allows for same-sex couples to be acknowledged on on a federal level. So if you have a significant other um, that you have um, been in a relationship with, although you all can have a civil union, you can be married um, in whatever form that you would consider being married um, in a same-sex relationship, the federal government has to acknowledge you as a couple. They have to provide you with benefits. They have to give you access to health care. They have to um, allow you to make those last uh, decisions for your significant other. And we as members of society have to acknowledge them as well. Now, how you do that is your decision, but we do have to acknowledge that these individuals are a part of society and that there is about to be a very large growing number of them, particularly in California, where Proposition 8 is another case that um, was struck down. And this actually legalizes marriage in the state of California. What I mean by struck down is this would the initial Proposition 8 was they wanted it to only acknowledge marriage between a man and a woman. And this says, no, that that is not constitutional. Marriage is between whoever you feel you love and care about and want to be with, whether that's same sex or um, not. So, touchy subject and situation. Y'all know where I stand <laughs> on this. I'm, I'm for it. It's not going to hurt me in my daily life. Mm-hmm. Um, for those members that I know of my family and friends who are of the same sex couple this is what they need Mm -hmm. when you think about your partner being in the ER and you can't go back because you're his girl or boyfriend or girlfriend or husband wife whatever the case may be that I want my loved one to be able to be with somebody if Mm -hmm. they're dying Mm -hmm. if he happens to have a, a husband so be it as opposed to him dying by himself and then, I mean, we could talk about this all day, but mm-hmm. I, I'm okay with it. I'm, a, I'm in agreement as well. As far as a federal law. Mm-hmm. And concerned. federally acknowledging that these individuals have the right to be acknowledged the same way that uh, heterosexual couples do. And um, there is now going to be a, an influx of bills that are going to be proposed across the nation to acknowledge marriage between two men, two women, a man and a woman, however they want to define their union. What do you think, sir? Well, yeah, I think you're, you're right. Based on that decision, I think uh, a lot of states that don't have some kind of marriage, uh, that, that currently don't allow marriage between uh, men and a marriage between two women, um, you're going to see bills be floated uh, to, get that, get, to get that done mm-hmm. uh, based on that ruling from the Supreme Court. And, um, you know, I've said before, you know, hey, if they want to get married, let them do what they do, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it doesn't, um, you know, I think a lot of, you have to remember that a lot of the, the pushback goes back to, you know, the, the Christian perspective and everything. And, you know, I hold my Christian principles. I still say that it's a sin, you mm-hmm. know. But, uh, but you know, we don't regulate sin from a governmental perspective for the right. most part. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that we need to regulate this sin. Um, as well, but uh, but yeah, it's, you know they do what they do and and kind of get ready because you know that that was the landmark case to to pretty much free up 
uh, same sex marriages to just, you know, boom yeah. across, you know, statewide. You but know? don't worry, Florida. We don't have to worry about seeing that anytime soon. <laughs> we, we have plenty of time and we won't see a bill like that. Well, we, we may see a bill, but it won't happen here in the state of Florida anytime soon. No. Nah. We can barely get health care together here. Nah. Right. N- not, no. not with our uh, Republican dominated Congress. Mm-mm. I doubt, I doubt yeah. that uh, will happen in the state of Florida. But, you know, Democrats too may bring it to the case. Bring it to the floor. They'll, they'll try. But, they'll, they'll probably try. Uh, like you said, I doubt. It'll be a minute before something like that happens here in Florida. Mm-hmm. We'll see. We'll see. They, they do surprise you every now and then. They do surprise you every now and we'll then. We'll see. We'll see. 407 1680 is the number. 407 1680 is the number. What do you say, Mr. Uh, Jeremy? What the, oh, about to say. Oh, me personally, I, I don't mind, you know, from a civil standpoint. I'm in agreement, you know, from a, a religious standpoint. How I mean, I, I guess I understand why they don't want it because a lot of them feel it's just a, another step um, towards a direction that they're not comfortable with. But from a still point, st- civil standpoint, I should say, from a civil standpoint, I don't see the issue with it. You know, if we're going to talk about civil rights, you know, they have just as much right as everybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and, and that's and that's the thing. They have as much rights as everybody else to sort of be free, like everyone else, right? That's be true. free. Yes. Everybody wants to be free. Be free <laughs> or miserable. Or miserable. Or miserable. Or miserable. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> or miserable. One of the two. One of the two. That's that's typically what you get. You got to get a very happy moment in time, or you get some miserable moments in time. I remember some, some people say, "Be careful what you wish for." That is so <laughs> funny. <laughs> that is so funny. Can you imagine? I fought all this time to get married. No, I can't stand you. <laughs> nah, nah, I want to see the first one on divorce court. Right, right. Now that is going. To <laughs> that be will be. Yeah, but hey, they just like. And you, and you know, else. somebody's going to bring it up. Well, you know, there's a case about um, there's a lesbian couple who's trying to get split custody of a child right now. Oh. And the state, it's here in Florida, and the state's trying to figure out who is legally the mother. Mm. It, the child was adopted, and neither one of them actually gave I birth? I think so. Mm. That's interesting. Or it could have been that wow. one of the mothers carried the egg from the other mother. It could have been that sort of situation, so it still oh, makes that's it even, difficult. That's, oh, that's real deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dang. That's that's interesting. It's getting complicated. The We're judge will have to go Solomon on them. I tell you what, let's cut the baby in half and split. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right down the middle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I don't know why that would be so difficult, though. It would be the same in marriages or other relationships. And when you're divorced, you know, one parent gets visitation or you split custody. But I guess in that case, I mean, if you're using the egg, but then you carried it. Well, I guess. And yeah, and I guess it's the same, same thing. thing. Now, I guess so. From a scientific standpoint, whose DNA does the baby have? Mm. Well, the, the, the baby would have the DNA of the parent whose uh, whose egg it came from. So. Well, there it is. That's it. So almost That's like it. a so surrogate. So nothing gets passed huh? on. So it would be like a surrogate. Like a surrogate. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ooh. Yes, it's, it's no different from a surrogate situation. That's an mm-hmm. interesting oh, okay. case. The baby's DNA would be the, the DNA of whoever the egg of came the from. the egg came from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Basically. <sighs> So that's how that would go. But, no, but uh, what, what, what if the donor came in? Say, I want it. I think that they relinquished all his rights from the beginning. Oh, before yeah, the process they they usually sign those papers yeah. so that doesn't happen. Get my lawyer. Uh, I, want, I want mine too. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did. <laughs> but, but he donated and, and was gone. Mm-hmm. Took his check and kept going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, man. But th- those, those, those cases are interesting, especially, like, the voter rights. I've been, I've been listening all week um, to a lot of different opinions on the voters' rights um, mm-hmm. and one. And, you know, most, a lot of people kind of the doom and gloom story that you just kind of gave me there, uh, Miss Bernie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> doom and gloom, but the, it's somebody's reality. The, Thank uh, you. The world is about to end. <laughs> Voter <laughs> rights for, for black and brown people are going to be disintegrated. And, it's a struggle. And, uh, and we're going to struggle to now be able to vote in the future. And you know, I, I just have to be honest with you. Um, I, I just don't buy any of that. 407-894-1680 is the number. 407-894-1680 is the number. Black I mean, I, 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 get, I get that, um, again, you know, when it comes to what they said, they said Congress can create new maps. 
So if Congress doesn't create new maps, it's just another reason for you to look at whomever is representing you, and that's another strike um, against what they already aren't doing for you. Um, so, you know, so you can vote that out, vote them out, I should say, and then vote somebody in that who will go in in Washington and then take up these issues to make sure new maps are created so that discrimination does not occur. Mm -hmm. um, so so we, we can do that. That's our right as uh, citizens who vote. We can vote the right people in who will do with the things that we want them to do. Uh, but but to suggest that, that our rights now are going to get stripped away from us, uh, and that we're going to go back 40 years and from where we are today. <laughs> well, why are we still talking about the Voters' Rights Act that was created in 1965? Right. A portion of that was in the Supreme Court this week. We are we have taken it back. We're, we're there. We're, we're talking about it be, because, yes, there's some individuals that, that you know, believe that we, we haven't come that far. But, but I don't see it that way. You know, I just don't see it that way. Or I don't think that we've not come that far. I do think again there there are some some of these laws are going to discriminate against people. You know, most of them are discriminating against people who aren't educated on what's happening in the country, and I think that's that's essentially why a lot of these laws are created, especially after you know the way the president got voted in. Um, you know, which is probably one of the things that was a red flag for them. You know, because scared. It, it's, it's mm -hmm. scared, right? They're because because they see they see him inspiring a lot of people who aren't educated on what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but yet they're voting. But in but they have no idea what's happening, yeah, and that's their right. I, I'm I'm with you. That is their right. But that's where the law comes from. It doesn't come from you know purposely you know, discriminating against black and brown people. That is not where it comes from. Hmm. That is not the version of it. You We're know? Not, we're, you're it's not it's discriminating that. against. You're not serious. That's, I am that's, serious. You're not that's serious. serious. That's, that's serious. your opinion. He has been that drinking the Kool-Aid over at Fox. His homeboys, Sean Kent, no. Hannity, Glenn Beck. You're not Michelle serious. Bachman, I like those serious. are his role dolls. He's so serious. I, I am so serious He's when so I serious. say that. It is not specifically you designed. You and uh, what's your, it's, what's it's your boy South Florida against, been drinking the same tea? What's, it's what's it's the designed Allen? against huh? the Allen. uneducated. Yeah, that's him. Yeah. Allen West. It's designed against the uneducated because those and are the people. And who are the uneducated or undereducated? Who are those There's people? They're the black and the some brown Some of them are people. black. Some of them brown. Some of them white. Majority of them you know are not saying? white, Some though. of them Asian. You know, they, mm -hmm. they all over the case. Mm -hmm. it's, now, is it? Now, is it, I would say this. I will agree with you on that point. They are attacking all low-income people because even the low-income white people, they don't like them either. Well, and they shouldn't be discriminated against either. Exactly, though. But that's that's the point. Exactly, they shouldn't be discriminated against against them either. There is an attack on at, on at the, the poor class the day, in general. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, all of this is solved when when people as a whole get involved in the process. Meaning, you you don't just vote because your mama told you so and so was a good guy. You vote because you read about so and so, and then you thought so-and-so was a good guy mm -hmm. you know that that's how you solve all of all of these problems if people would just do their homework and do what they're supposed to do um which is educate yourself on what's happening you know none of this would matter it, it wouldn't matter what law they create it wouldn't matter you know and none of that would matter if we if everybody did their homework which is which is what the expectation you or at least what you hope people do now it's unfortunately that there's a large number of people who vote that don't do any homework and, and could care less for that matter, you know, like I said. But, you know, these laws are not specifically designed for specific black and brown people. Yeah, low so not, not, I don't even say low income. I say uneducated voters. That was a really but, great story you just gave us. It, it was. really was. It was really nice. <laughs> that was a sweet story. Unfortunately, though, <laughs> you know, like when you when you went to school when you were little and they taught you going to jail was wrong. You learn about this all through school. Now, this is a part of your education process. You know, you learn about this all while you're young. The police are going to get you if you do something bad. You grow up and you start stealing. You grow up and you start killing folk and you start doing all, all kind of crazy things. But you were educated about this all while you were young, growing up. But you but you end up in jail. So, yes, education is important, but if you don't listen to what is being taught to you, if you don't care to have a conversation about what's happening to you, you just completely don't care about the process, but you were, you were educated on it. You just don't care about the process. There are still other people who are in place to help you through that process. Like, 
once you've learned your lesson, and I think people are learning their lesson from this particular um, case. I think people are learning their lessons from 2012 when people are trying to strip them of their rights to vote or their access to voting information or access to days to vote by eliminating mm-hmm. almost four days of voting. Come on yeah. now, that Sunday before um, voting, Souls to the Polls? That's great. It is, it is called Souls to the Polls for a reason. Black folks are those souls that mm-hmm. are going to the polls and marching and voting for those people that they want to vote for. Clear discrimination. Clear. But whoever was representing this particular case in the Supreme Court didn't do a good enough job. No. And, and like I said, the next day in Texas, one particular uh, county for black people, they were they're trying to shut it down to four precincts for entire um, community of people. And I, wow. the county itself is escaping me right now. Whereas on the white side, and it is predominantly a white, more Republican based county. And she knows this because she educated herself. On I it. educated myself. <laughs> 20 I precincts. It. 25 where the majority on that side where the the Republicans are the population doesn't even require that many precincts whereas the population in this African American brown community needs that pre those precincts they cut it down to five wow that was the next day once this was delivered well, yeah, I remember that the uh, based on this decision, they also shot down the Texas um, the Texas voter law that had got shot down by the Supreme Court. Actually, was now allowed yeah, the next um, day. to proceed. Now that you know, after this particular at murder. midnight, mm-hmm. matter of fact, you I know, think the, the they, they know y'all ain't go wait in line. That's why they get y'all down the phone. Like, man, I'm going home. It ain't that serious. <laughs> <laughs> At least crazy. that's what they're hoping. That's yeah, what that's what they're hoping. That's exactly hoping. what they're hoping. So for. four precincts, long lines. They're like, nah, I ain't gonna go. Exactly, mm-hmm. directed right at us. Yeah. Thank now, you. you disagree with that one? Uh, I, I, that, that, here's yeah. what I would say to that. Here's <laughs> what I would say to that. There, there are. Um, again, we know that this is 2013, and there's some discrimination out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'll be the first to tell you that's the truth. But uh, no, I do not think the the entire country, every single state that has a voter ID law, every intention of the first person who thought to create one was how can we discriminate against black and brown people? Look at the party who put those laws in order. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Uh, this is ends another week of Real Family Talk. Uh, we thank y'all for listening. We thank Miss Bernie for stopping by. Uh, this is your host, Jay Real. This is 1680 WOKB. You can follow us on Facebook, Real Family Talk. You can follow us on Twitter, Real Family Talk. The website, realfamilytalk.weebly.com. WOKB, Winter Garden, Orlando.